Hello, this is Margaret Ajibola, the STEM Positive Disruptor. And on Maya's conversation, I have a special guest, Sarah Schonkweiler. She's an engineer, educator, and a disability inclusion and STEM equity advocate from the USA. Would you tell us more about that? I'm, I'm going to describe myself because, <laughs> you know, we talk about disability and we, this, this, we're doing a series on talking about STEM and disability. So I'm going to try my best. So I'm, um, I'm a black female. Um, I, ha I wear glasses <laughs> and I've got a patterned top. <laughs> so I, I apologize if I'm not as, you know, as deeply descriptive, but I hope that will help. Thank you. So welcome, um, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'll describe myself as well. I'm a middle-aged cisgender white woman wearing glasses and dark glasses that actually have flowers all over them and uh, my on again, off again hair, which <laughs> sometimes I have and sometimes I don't, is wrapped up in two colorful scarves today. Um, they're burgundy. And my shirt says um, is burgundy and it says rare and resilient. And it has the rare disease awareness zebra ribbon on it because sometimes the hoof beats are zebras. And underneath it, it says hidden disability awareness. I have quite a collection of disability t-shirts. <laughs> I had to decide which one to wear today because Dr. Stephanie Van introduced us on this ability clinic, not disability clinic, as the fashion capital of disability advocacy. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Actually, I picked this one because... Um, Hidden disabilities are not at all rare. My own chronic illness, um, I identify as disabled and my own chronic illness is rare. But I, And I think a lot of us with disabilities are definitely resilient, but hidden disabilities are not rare at all. In fact, the majority of disabilities are, are hidden or what I like to say non-apparent because I think a lot of us do hide our disabilities. I certainly did as mm -hmm. both an engineer and well, and a K-12 teacher before this and now in higher ed. So, and in my background, I'm, I've been displaced to Ohio in the U.S. for quite a few months for doctor's appointments. So I finally decided to just decorate the spare bedroom at my dad's house. <laughs> Why <laughs> so not? I have a really colorful math poster because I'm on that side because I've got reverse camera on, but it's um, because I'm really into math accessibility and all my favorite books are on the bookshelf behind me. The newest one is Disability is Human by Dr. Stephanie Cawthon, which I really like. And I have her workbook here too, because I'm working on a workshop about talking about disability. So this is really good timing. And she has some activities that you can do to open up the conversation. Do you know, you're so right. And I thank you so much for that. And I think it's so important. I, you know, I do like like the, the theme on that disability, you know, because there's so many hidden, um, disability itself is not the obvious to everyone. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, it's most times actually hidden and people are too afraid to talk about it. And this is why we set up this platform. We want to educate, we want to raise awareness and change perception and demystify. But look at it from the STEM perspective, because we want to be inclusive. We talk about the things that are not working. And, you know, if we ourselves are not accommodating, it's ever so difficult to change um, how we do things. And I think for you to be accommodated, you've got to understand what it is. And one of the things I was thinking about is that, um, Disability itself is no respect of person. You could be born with it, but you can actually become disabled in a, in a period of your of your life. And that means we have to be aware of that. That means we need to put ourselves in that person's shoe. What about if it was me? What would you do with it differently? So again, I know today we want to talk about inclusive teaching, and this is why I want to really talk more about it. But I wanted to raise that. that we should always have that in the back of our mind. That, Disability itself is no, it's 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 no respect of it. it. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, if you're black or Absolutely. white. Absolutely, it's it There's doesn't a matter. Quote. I have a quote that I um 
pull it up so I make sure I get it right, from Jonathan Kaufman in um, a report called An Inclusive Future of Work. Mm -hmm. um, it says, disability is the essence of diversity by definition. It runs across race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomics, culture, and the most important thing, as you said, it's the only minority group that anyone can join at any time, which makes it unique. Mm -hmm. So by accident, illness, injury, aging, yeah. <laughs> any yeah. one of us can, <laughs> can become happen. disabled at any time. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, and going just going back slightly again, because disability again, as you mentioned, it, it's it's just one of those things that does happen. It it could be temporary, it could be long term, but yes. it still happens. Now in the workers or in the education system, because my last conversation with Emma, uh, the conversation I had with Emma is that um from the um education side of things they said they've never met anyone who was disabled that's because as you mentioned the hidden disability is not always known because unless I tell you that I am disabled you won't know that and there's the there's a stigma where disability is concerned therefore for me to share that information with you I have to feel comfortable to do that to know that there would be no repercussion and so this is so so critical critical and I want you to be able to because based on your experience, because you, as you said, you're an engineer um, and you moved into education for, for yeah, reasons. It's interesting because um, I, I love Stephanie's book, Disability is Human. The title says it all. But Indeed. Um, this is another book that I thought of when Emma was speaking. The interview that I that you had just posted on YouTube, yeah. which I really loved, with was with Emma Collington, who's a um, PhD student with a disability. This one is called Uncharted how scientists navigate their own health research and experiences of bias. And it was really interesting for me because it's STEM students, faculty, researchers who have disabilities and their own experiences in STEM fields. And it's, it, Emma had said that she was basically pushed out of the lab yeah. in her interview. And so when, you were talking about like who's who's in STEM and I hear that all the time too. Our faculty say, we don't have any students with disabilities. Yes, you do. Mm. You just don't know it. And mm. so they may not have disclosed or they never made it into your class because they were shut out of what we call the STEM pipeline long before they ever made it into higher ed or even undergrad. So they're not there because they were pushed out, shut out, or, you know, not didn't feel comfortable with STEM fields, or they're just not telling you that you have a disability, like exactly as you said. In, indeed, and I think that's why it's so important that we continue to raise awareness, we continue to educate. Um, also, I, I think, also, I think I was reading about your inclusive teaching and talked about the stigma of disclosure or the fear of the bar barrier that people face. And so they, they're afraid to actually in, um, disclose that they have some form of disability until something happens. And then the question arises that why? So this is why I, you know, I would like to delve straight into why is it so important for us to really look at our the setup, the, the architecture, the design, the layout of how to make it more inclusive for people with disability because that's what that's our topic stem and disability so what would you say because you have you're an expert you have the experience not only just from a personal perspective because that's what you do so can you please share with that with us sure i i was in engineering for um a long time about half of my career was in engineering as an engineer and then i actually left that field to go into K-12 teaching because I wanted to make a bigger impact on who gets to be in STEM. Mm -hmm. So I was really focused originally on socioeconomic, race, and gender disparities and the STEM pipeline. But the first school I taught at was for students who um, are neurodivergent, so dyslexia, dyscalculia, um, some students with well, a lot of students with ADHD, because that's often um, occurs with dyslexia, dyscalculia, but some students with autism. So it really kind of changed my perspective, like, because I was seeing these really bright students 
who didn't feel capable of going into STEM fields or whose teachers were telling them they couldn't mm. in the public school. In our mm. private school, they were certainly telling them you can do anything you want. <laughs> but we tell students that and then they run into these barriers yeah. where they truly maybe can't do anything they want. I have two students right now who are really close to my heart. One I um, picked up as a I'm a home hospital teacher, so I go to the okay. home sometimes of students who um, can't be in the public school setting for one reason or another. They may have mm -hmm. a, a medical disability or they may have a mental health disability. And this student in the third grade was truly suicidal over his math ability. Mm -hmm. And it was so hard for me as a teacher. But I, he, I've told him he's I'm his second mom for life. <laughs> well, <no. laughs> he's not getting rid of me <laughs> so he's actually taking his driver's test today oh so I'm gosh. sending him lots of prayers that he's yeah, gonna yeah, get, yeah. It, I'm sure get his will. driver's license because that that will be really cool but just over the years now he has one more math class he has to pass and he was already been told by the local community college not to mention that he has a disability when he applies and I'm like oh so much we can say about that. And then I have another student who I've known for 10 years now. I met her in the ninth grade and she told me in ninth grade, there's nothing wrong with my brain. It's my body that doesn't work. She yeah. was um, using a wheelchair and we would meet at Barnes and Noble, which is a bookstore here in the U.S. And I realized later it was because her family was homeless because of the costs of her medical care and that. So We've kept in touch and she's recently lost uh, most of her vision due to um, ongoing progression of her disability. And she was recently told she shouldn't go to college because there's nothing she could do in STEM or nursing and medicine with low vision. And I'm like, no, that's not true. We're, <laughs> we're gonna change that narrative. So inclusive teaching like really starts so far back when our students are in their younger years now oh. i'm i'm really blessed to be in a position now where i um, help design engineering classes at johns hopkins so i get to use my engineering and my education i just never expected to use my disability <laughs> and so it, it took me a really long time to yeah. even talk to my coworkers and my boss about the fact that i have yeah. a disability which is chronic illness and to go public and share that with my faculty and to share that in workshops was, mm. was kind of a big decision. And I still wonder if it was, well, I know it was the right decision. I'm certain of that, but I'm a teach access fellow this year. So teach access is a nonprofit, um, that provides a ton of free resources for educators on how okay. to teach about accessibility, mm -hmm. um, which I love, but one of my LinkedIn posts started with, how ironic is it that I'm a 2024 Teach Access Fellow and I'm debating whether or not it's safe to say I have a disability? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's crazy, but I think in a way it's hard because again, because, okay, this is my assumption again, it, it's, because of the way people think, and sometimes you, for you to disclose something, you've got to feel safe to do that. And you, you don't sometimes know what the repercussions could be. Again, it's that unknown factor. And I think for you to, you, for you to be think, still thinking that way, it's because you've seen things around you, your, your percept, you, you can see, not so much your perception, it's what you, what you know, the, what you get from the environment that then dictates you what who and what you can say, how much information you can give to anyone at any time because of certain things maybe you've heard or people's behavior, their attitude towards certain people because of their disability. So, um, I mean, I, again, I, I'm not your, you know, sometimes you try to be in that person's place and, and, and empathize and try and understand what, what they're thinking, why they feel that way. I think a lot of um, people, well, it's interesting. I have a, a student um, from another country who reached out to me on LinkedIn and asked if if I thought it was a good idea for him to disclose he has a disability. He's applying for his chemistry PhD. 
And I said, it's so hard for me to advise you on that because it, it depends. I mean, I, yeah. I have advised other students to disclose their disabilities and then they've experienced outright discrimination. So I'd like to say that I would love to say it's safe, but even for myself, I'm like, is this going to affect me in promotions and job changes yeah. down the road? And, and people say, well, if, if, you're going to be discriminated against because you have a disability. You don't want to work for that company anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it depends. There's, I do love that we're able to make a difference in companies by raising awareness about yeah. disability. So I yeah. think that's a lot of what I do. On the inclusive teaching front, I'll share a slide I have real quick because um, I love... Actually, it doesn't look like I can share a slide, but that's okay. We can put it in the um, in the show notes. I presented a, a couple conferences recently with some of my space systems engineering faculty from Johns Hopkins um, because we've started talking to students about accessibility quite a lot in our mm -hmm. courses. And um, I think like as a little bit of backstory, the reason I decided to finally go public and say that I have a chronic illness disability is another engineering faculty member challenged me because I was advocating for my students, yeah. but I wasn't saying like, I have a disability. Practice what and, you preach. <laughs> yeah. And I was, she was like, Sarah, yeah, you're yeah. a female engineer. Mm -hmm. You have, um, you have a disability. You're teaching teachers about inclusive teaching. I teach chemistry and physics content and method. So I'm teaching teachers how to teach STEM and using um, universal design as a social justice tool. So like how to involve all of our students, regardless of um, race, gender, ethnicity, disability. Yeah. And I wasn't like being a role model for them and saying I have a disability. I think I did tell some of my students, like as I got into personal conversations with them, yeah. I would say that, but I wasn't, you know, it wasn't part of my identity that I was listing as a yeah. faculty member. And she said, you know, our students need role models. Our students yeah. need to know it's okay to say that they have a disability. So she's the one that got had me get the t-shirt that says disability is not a bad word trust me I know all of them <laughs> I know that would be a good one <laughs> bias captions like yeah, it goes yeah. through the alphabet <laughs> indeed yeah but, yeah it, it's so and I, you know what do you say thank you to your colleague who told you to disclose that because sometimes for, the, for people to relate to you, they've got to know that you have an experience or you have a personal experience. This is why you're driving for, not because you want to tick the boxes. And I think doing that makes the difference and it helps them to feel confident to tell others about what's going on with them. Because if my, if Miss, or I don't know if they call you a lecturer or Miss or how they call you, or Prof or whatever, that, you know, they, they, they appreciate that. It's hard. But also I think, for you to break down barriers, you have to, in a way, have to stand out in the crowd. It's hard sometimes, but you have to do something that's so out of the box that force people to notice. And then they're forced to start thinking differently as well. And that's what you've done. So thank you so much. So <laughs> it's been amazing how many conversations that started. Yeah. I mean, it was scary for me at first. Yeah. Um, one of my space systems faculty in particular has, <laughs> has listened to me process all of this over the past year and a half. But I mean, I think my faculty have been great because as I've said to them, like I have a disability, like yesterday was a flare day. We had to just reschedule yeah. our podcast cool. because yeah. yesterday I was really sick. And just the ability for me to say that to you and to my faculty, yeah. um, then they feel like they can tell me what's going on in their own lives. Of course. And they don't feel, um, you know, they don't feel like they have to make up excuses for moving meetings. I honestly just got tired of <laughs> having you know, to yeah. make up an excuse or something and pretend I 
felt well, great on days that I didn't. So it's nice to be able yeah. to just. Well, well look, look at you now. Time. You're 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 making changes. You you're breaking down barriers for others that are falling behind you. And I think also what you're doing. I I, I love your energy. I love the fact that you are willing to put yourself out there in order to make it different for others coming behind you and i do love the fact that you're also mentoring this young this, you talk about the two people that you are actually working with and it makes such a huge difference because you get, you're building their confidence something's so hard it's hard because society said oh if you're this or that then we can't include it's so it's not intentional, but that's what happens where you become ex excluded rather than being included. And what you want, what you're saying as, as an advocate, you want to change that. And that's what you're doing. So I applaud you and I, I celebrate what you're doing. I really do admire what you're doing, especially in this um, education space. It's so, so important because it's got to start somewhere. And I, I, in the work environment, we talk about it, but it's 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 about practicing what you preach and practicing, putting put in place that will make it possible. And so, you know, thank you so much. But, you know, I'd like you to sort of like maybe talk more about the STEM equity. You know, you talk about mass accessibility, those sort of things. But how do we, I mean, how can we make it possible? I mean, it's, we talk a lot about these things, but in let, let's talk about it more. <laughs> yeah, I sense. agree. Because I think it's raising awareness. Yeah. I, I, I've worked in the STEM, like in the STEM pipeline. I've been a K-12 teacher. I've taught in higher ed. I teach teachers about that. But I didn't even really think about math accessibility for a long time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really until I took this position and started thinking about the fact that our math is so inaccessible and math mm -hmm. is such a key thing for all STEM fields. And then I realized, you know, not only is our educational system not accessible, we're not making routinely making math accessible as we're teaching students, but also once people, you know, graduate and they're in the field. So for working STEM professionals, content isn't accessible. Like yeah. all of the research papers and that, how do you get access to that, which is vital to doing your job in STEM mm -hmm. fields. And I think so much of it is not, you know, it's not intentional. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the reasons I really decided to go public with my own disability was I just decided to go ahead and apply at high ed web mm -hmm. to talk about math accessibility with two of my colleagues, um, Alexa Valdez and, and Mal Rizzuto and, and Katie Springer has joined us on that a lot too. And so we talk about math accessibility because other people are not aware of that either. So it's mm -hmm. not that they're being purposely excluding um, students or professionals but I think that's part of STEM equity too. If our yeah. students don't have access that's to true. technical content, yeah. then they can't do yeah. the STEM, yeah. um, yeah. you know, all of it. Engineering, obviously I talk about engineering a lot, but I've you know, been reminded STEM and medicine because yeah. if you can't access the content in your courses, and you're maybe uncomfortable asking or feeling like that squeaky wheel of constantly having to, you know, getting accommodations mm. is a difficult process mm. in a lot of universities. Um, one of my students who's dyslexic was told that she needed to um, be recertified as dyslexic, even though mm. it's a lifetime yeah. disability. Well, and, exactly. and she came from a... Um, a disadvantaged socioeconomic area and race and didn't have access to going to a neuropsychiatrist and getting re-diagnosed. So she didn't get disability accommodations in college and she's done it, you know, she's amazing professional, yeah. but yeah. it has not been easy. No, and I think this is why we do what we do. What is why we edit? We try to edit, raise awareness. It's so important because unless we, unless it's put in front of people to stop people thinking, or because you know you talk about the hidden disability. This is the, what basically we're saying is that the hidden disability is not always understood, mm -hmm. or because they don't feel they have evidence enough. So unless you have the certification saying 
well, Margaret actually brought it is this. We right. can't, we don't actually truly believe that's the case. That's basically what you say. And so absolutely. It, and and that's why it's so important for us to do what we do. That's why you've come on board to talk about that and the need for us to raise awareness because you no, know, but that's frustrating. Actually, I was just thinking about because do, do you know Richard Branson, um, the Virgin Airline mm -hmm. owner? He's just recently just started, and I, I don't know, it was on LinkedIn, and he's um, saying he's joined with um, an organization to provide a dyslexic online university for dyslexics or something like that. Oh, like really? That. I'll have to look that up. That's interesting. Yeah, and so it's quite interesting. But he, the thing is, he's in that position of where he owns a business, but sometimes people are not relate they don't relate to those people who are coming up do who have those disabilities they want profit they want to have that productivity but they you know sometimes they cater for certain types of people people want they define as normal i think why we do this is we want to change that we want to raise awareness and demystify that so you're going to right say and i love that um i mean it dyslexia neurodivergence they're an asset in stem yeah. fields that's what of i talk course. about a lot yeah. that, um with dyslexia um some stats say there's like one in five 20 percent of the population is dyslexic however it can be much higher in stem yeah. fields particularly in space systems mm -hmm. field where i do a lot of work so i've talked to my faculty about that and as i'm you know my faculty are becoming comfortable talking to me because several of them like at our first meeting i say we're going to design your class so it's accessible and inclusive and they'll say oh really oh, okay i'm dyslexic and i'm like all right <laughs> that's great and it's funny when i say have you ever talked to your students about that mm -hmm. no 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 yeah. but one of my faculty said could we please just design my class as if all of our students are born perfect i was like yes we can <laughs> thank <laughs> you for saying that okay. because his point was like we label students yeah. so early, but then again, in order to get accommodations in, on some level, you need those labels. Yeah. And, and I know it's different in different yeah. countries. It seems the UK is actually ahead of the United States in many ways with dyslexia awareness and that. But mm -hmm. one of the things that we talk about a lot in my department is taking a proactive approach yeah. to making our courses accessible to mm -hmm. talking about accessibility, like the language we use, the way the yeah. class is laid out, our content being accessible to a variety of disabilities, because taking that proactive approach means students don't have to request accommodations. Yeah. So it saves them that extra step sure. and um, it makes them feel welcome yeah. from the beginning yeah so i think that's you know that's really our goal in all of this well and that's why yeah. i teach about math accessibility and that yeah. so other people can be more well, proactive yeah indeed you know and that's you know and that's what you're doing i i do love <laughs> you know just your your action what you're doing to to promote that and i really so i, I really i am impressed with you i really love what you do i love <laughs> your energy because you are breaking those barriers down. People are aware of what you're doing. And, you know, people, and not just in your, your space, but beyond your space. And I think that's so, so important. And if, I think, in a way, just, you know, just going back to my first um, conversation with Emma and you, mm -hmm. I think the key, one of the things I'm hearing a lot is that there has to be a way of us marrying our, being able to disclose our disability with what's to happen the next day it may not happen in our time but for us to change something we have to start from somewhere and i think one of the things that emma was saying that you need it's important for us to disclose it from the outset the yes. discrimination is there we know that but how can we change it because there's going to be somebody who may know somebody that has it or they may themselves have it and think hold on a minute i can relate to that person let's do mm -hmm. something even if they do it in such a secret way but they're thinking maybe we need to change the way we do these things. And I think this is so, so important. And that's why I'm so grateful that you've come on. It's very short, but I really, I really enjoy I I I'm seriously so much information that Sarah's given me, I'm gonna share with everybody <laughs> because I'm telling you, especially when inclusive teaching is concerned, 
just been on understanding. I think this is why we do we do. We want to raise awareness, we want to change perception, and we want to educate and demystify, demystify things about disability, the known and the unknown disability. And that's why Sarah, Sarah is doing that in her own space and beyond her space. And that's why she, you know, she said, I, I started off as an engineer, then I went into education because I want to change something and became a, a, an advocate for disability because I wanted to include, make it more, our, our world to be more diverse and inclusive. And she's doing a great job doing that. So, you know, I, I please listen to this very short, but there's so much information I'll be sharing with you from, from Sarah to, so, and if you have any questions, Please contact Sarah. How can I get, get in contact with you? I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Okay. I'm not real great at any of those other social media. Okay. Sites, but tell people definitely to reach out on LinkedIn because I do try to share resources on there as we do more presentations in that. We have some yeah. of our math accessibility workshops on there and I, you know, we'd love to get those. And and I do want to keep in touch with you too, Margaret, oh, because when, I think when, you have a lot of shared interests. In we, we will be, seriously, we will be. I'll be fighting. Say, Come on, open that door, Sarah. I want to talk to you. <laughs> but Still no, positive like... disruptor. I love that. <laughs> That's what we are. That's what we what are, is? right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that. But you might be, do you know something sometimes Distance does not stop us from, from, from engaging. I think, as you said, there's so many common grounds that enables us to, to work together, talk. And why that's how friendship develops and that's how we move forward as human beings because we need each other anyway. And, that, you know, so I am grateful that you've come into my life. I'm grateful that you agreed to do this podcast with me. So thank you so much. So, um, Again, thank you, Sarah. I know it's very short. It wasn't in deep, but if they need more information, we'll I'll share the, the links you sent, sent to me, but also if they need more information, they can get in contact with you as well. So thank Sounds you great. again. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you again. This is Margaret Ajibola, the STEM Positive Disruptor. Um, please, if you like this content, please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your network. We want to change how people see people with disability. We want to be the change that we want to see in others. And for us to do that, this is why we do put this platform to educate, to raise awareness, change perception and demystify. Demystify by STEM, but also people that work within STEM to bring our, to make our world more inclusive and accessible and diverse. For us to do that, we do what we do here today. So thank you very much. Thank you.